Well, I was born in Trieste, Italy, but yeah, that's kind of it hasn't helped me join the mafia I've tried many times. <laughs> but uh, my father, my parents came uh, in the 50s to the U.S. My dad came here for, for graduate school to do his PhD at Harvard. And eventually he settled in Boulder, Colorado with a whole professorship in theoretical physics. Um, and I just happened to be born on one of the sabbatical years. I think the Italian heir got to live and you know, was rather romantic. Um, but I really grew up in Boulder. I mean, we were only in Trieste for a couple of months. But Boulder was an amazing place. I mean, it continues to be an amazing place, but at that time there was still enough of that leftover hippie culture, and there was a lot of alternative education, and, you know, I went to an elementary school that had no walls, um, which was great. You could shout to your friends in the fourth grade. And, you know, it was really something else, but but uh, it was a school with uh, a school district with an amazing music program, so I had a lot of great opportunities very early on to kind of pursue whatever I wanted to. And so, what kind? I'm, I'm really thrown by the fact that you were raised in Boulder. Um, somehow, I had this vision that you were raised in a, in a family steeped in, in listening to classical East Indian music all the time. And clearly, that may or may not have been right, but what kind of sounds and music did you listen to or were you exposed to when you were growing up, both at home and, and outside of the home? Well, I think, you know, I'm a child of the 80s, you know. I, <laughs> I grew up with a lot of 80s rock, for better or for worse. I mean, that was, what was on the radio was, was really what um, was mainly flowing through me. But, you know, I started playing saxophone in fourth grade. I was... 10 years old, and you know, as a saxophonist, obviously, being interested in that, I was also listening to other saxophonists. Um, so early on, you know, I think it's safe to say that you can't play Miles Davis or John Coltrane for a 10 year old and expect a, an amazing reaction. Sometimes, and, and that's wonderful if that happens, but for me, you know, my entrance into instrumental jazz was, was really through the kind of jazz rock fusion that was happening at the time, you know. Uh, one of the major inspirations for me, just as a beginning saxophonist, um, was Grover Washington Jr., who uh, as I hope some of you know was um, a really important figure, I think, in black music. And, and what he was doing was really considered instrumental soul or instrumental R&B. Um, unfortunately, as the instrumental contemporary instrumental jazz industry moved forward, um, the soul got sucked out of that music and it became smooth jazz and it became things that you hear and you know while you're getting a filling in your teeth or something but at the time it was very important and uh, the first major concert I ever went to was a Grover Washington concert when I was in seventh grade me and my dad went and we camped, I camped out with my dad for seats it was great um, and I'd never seen anything like that before. It was a triple bill with Pieces of a Dream and Patrice Russian and Grover. I mean, you can't even imagine a better concert. Um, and that was very impactful. Also, David Sanborn, I would say the same. Uh, again, we think of him as smooth jazz now, but at the time it really was instrumental R&B. The Brecker Brothers, the Yellow Jackets. I mean, those were the things I first heard. And then, of course, when I heard Charlie Parker, that was kind of... That was kind of it. That was when I was like, oh wow, I need to figure out how to do this as a living. Um, of course, I didn't say that to my parents until much later. And <laughs> but as far as Indian music, well, there are two other components to my kind of early education. You know, with Indian music, we had a few classical albums. I mean, we had, you know, some quintessential Ravi Shankar albums. We had some Shubha Lakshmi. We had, um, but what my parents were mainly listening to if they were at all, was, um, was bhajans, which are, you know, it's devotional music, it's, it's like temple music, which is very beautiful and, you know, cannot be discounted because even Indian classical music at its core is still coming from the Vedas, it's still spiritual music, it's, even though it's much more complex than, than the bhajans, which, you know, people know bhajans in the same way that you might know Christmas carols in the West, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's almost a vernacular. Um, but he, getting that sound in my ears was, was great as well. And then I, I just had a really amazing teacher from the very beginning who was into everything. Um, and I would go see him play and one night, it might be with a big band, and the next night it would be with a 
Afropop band, and then it might be some kind of quote-unquote avant-garde trio. And, um, and also, he was bringing albums over. This is back in that day where the private teacher came to your house. I think those days are almost <laughs> over. But he would, he would bring two or three LPs for me to, you know, loan me two or three LPs for the week. And it might be Sidney Bechet and Yes and, uh, you know, Duke Ellington or something. So I had this kind of very eclectic outlook, not knowing that I did. You know, I, I developed one very early on where I really understood that there was a lot of music that was valid um, and that you couldn't necessarily, it wasn't fair to say that music was bad when you're, when you're trying to look at style and genre. There's, there's music that's played well, there's music that's passionate and soulful, and, and maybe there's music that's not played so well. So, you know, all those things at once were um, kind of pushing me along at a young age. And I was also a, a real ham, you know, so I wanted to start a band as quickly as possible. I had a band in seventh grade, Butcher and Charlie Parker tunes, that turned into a band that later butchered Charlie, uh, John Coltrane tunes, you know, but at least I was out there trying. Um, and Boulder is also the home of the Pearl Street Mall, which I, if any of you watched Mork and Mindy, that's where, that's where Mindy's father's music store was. And not that that had a great impact on me, but that mall was really famous in the summertime for the street entertainers and musicians. And, um, and it, it amazes me to look back on it, but you know, I told my parents I wanted to go out there and play and try to make some money, and they were like, yeah, go. You know, so I was out there when I was 13 playing like, Mandy and the theme from MASH and All in the Family and you know just whatever I can learn off the TV or these, these kind of little pop tune books that, um, that were actually a lot of fun. So Boulder was an amazing place. I can't imagine a few other places where that would have happened. Well, it's actually